Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Um, today actually more like a negative type of theorem, we will see. Uh, so homotopy of spheres. What is that? And why is that a negative type of theorem? Um, so it's one of those kind of surprising aspects of mathematics where, well, a sphere is certainly nothing complicated, right? A sphere is just what we know, um, whatever S2. So a soccer ball, but there are still open questions about spheres. And this is one of them. And that's a bit surprising, at least if you see it for the first time, because, well, spheres, right? Spheres, well, can it get easier? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so it's, it's surprisingly hard. It's a very, very interesting statement. It's very, very hard. Um, honestly, if you do the calculation for the first non-trivial one, I show you uh, what you would need to do. I'm not going to show you the calculation. It's a bit too hard. Um, then you would realize, as I just said, it's a bit too hard. So you maybe, if you're an expert, you of course expect this to happen, but I still, oh, if you're an expert in topology in this case, um, but still it's kind of one of those surprising facts that, well, we don't know everything. Well, that's not very surprising, I guess. Uh, we actually don't know a lot, so we, we don't really know much, um, but we don't know everything about some simple object like a sphere. Uh, and well, here we go. Let's just get started. So um, the sphere, well, uh, is what it is. And I would like to discuss a certain type of algebraic invariant associated to spheres, which are called pi n in general. Um, so n goes from, well, it goes over the natural numbers. Whether you want to include zero or not, doesn't really matter. There's a pi zero, but I'm going to ignore it anyway. So I'm starting with uh, pi one. And pi one is just the following idea. So we have some space x. So pi one of x, that's what I should write. And I don't write it because I'm lazy. But anyway, pi one of x is just the, well, the set, if you want, the equivalence classes of all loops in that space uh, up to homotopy. So you have x, you have some base point somewhere, and you essentially throw a loop. So this is a loop in your space. And you see how the loop uh, the various different loops arrange themselves up to just pulling them around. That's what's called homotopy. So this loop, um, if it goes around the hole, so the hole is here in the middle and the other loop, they're, they're the same up to homotopy. So you can always squeeze it and wiggle it around um, as much as you want. So it, it essentially it measures how loops arrange themselves in your space X. Well, and it's not so important to get the details now, um, but this will be a group, so you can compose loops and so on. But anyway, it's kind of a measure how loops arrange in spaces. So um, loop, we think of it as a one-dimensional object, of course. Uh, we will think of it as in a second as an S1. So loops arrange themselves in spaces. So how S1, essentially the ways how S1 sits in your space. Um, turns out that it's a quite great invariant. So it's quite quite cool um, kind of data you can associate to your space. And it's actually all it's fairly computable, which is not so clear from the offset here. Uh, just loops and spaces, is that computable? Uh, what do I actually need to do? But turns out that it is a rather algebraic object and there are quite a few tools to study uh, this fundamental group. So that's what the name is. And the notation is pi one. So loops in spaces. And well, this goes back to uh, Poincaré basically, I guess, and was easy to generalize. So if you think of a loop as really just, a, a, well, a loop is just a, a circle where you just fix one point and you just walk around the circle and just put the circle in your space. Well, you can easily generalize that, right? Instead of putting a circle in your space, you put a sphere in your space and you do the same trick. You just fix some point and you just have the so-called pi n. So again, pi n of x, the higher ones, which is essentially a space of measuring how you could put various spheres into your space, where n is now the dimension of the sphere. So pi 2 would be the one for S2, where you would look at ways to put soccer balls into your space. Sounds very sophisticated. It's actually not so bad. It, it will be an abelian group in the end. Okay, so whatever. So you can compose them as you can see here. Then you get two spheres uh, along a point and kind of you consider them again 
up to kind of homotopy and you can pull them around in your space. So essentially, again, it should measure how spheres sit in your space or to be precise, because we have an N here, right? So how N spheres sit in your space. So you can associate this whole bunch of invariants, pi N, so for all N, you can associate that to your uh, to your space. And that's a really, really, really strong invariant of a topological space. So it's essentially a bunch of numbers associated to your space. I will make that precise in a second. And what you need to do is to calculate those numbers. So the question is, and that's really not clear here, uh, what about computability? So let's ignore the setting. So there will be some spheres and some loops and spaces, but essentially it boils down to computing a certain type uh, of numbers associated to your space. So that's my point for today. So there's a lot of numbers associated to your space. Um, so for example, you could think of uh, pi one of a soccer ball, uh, pi one of S2, and pi one of S2 is actually pretty simple. So pi one of S2 turns out to be trivial. And why is it trivial? Because you can shrink every loop to a point. And point is kind of a trivial loop where you don't move at all. And the way to see this is actually not so hard. Think of the equator here around uh, the, the, well, the Earth, and you can just pull it like a belt, pull it up and shrink it back to a point. So computing pi one of S2 is not very hard. So pi one is really, really easy to compute. Um, I haven't told you really the definition, but let's say the number you associate here is uh, trivial, right? So it's it's easy to see there's actually no way, uh, always how, how loops arrange themselves on a sphere are trivial because you can always contract them to a point in this kind of belt fashion where you pull them around, um, pull the equator around the earth. So you might think, okay, maybe, maybe we are able to compute pi n of S2, and essentially it will be a bunch of numbers. Uh, so n, let's say n is bigger than one, we already understand one, then it will be a bunch of numbers because essentially it's always of this form. There will be a few copies of, well, z, and then there will be some z mod n's. So we have a bu those bunch of numbers associated to them. And the question is, well, as, well, again, I said again, from abstract nonsense, it follows that this is an absolutely great invariant. So the only, th and well, it's determined by a few numbers, well, actually infinitely many because for all n, but anyway, still it's determined by numbers. So we would like to figure out what those numbers are, right? So just a bunch of numbers associated to your space. And well, okay, what space is the easiest non-trivial one to start with? Well, S2. So net, not as lower two as upper two, of course. So as upper two, um, uh, the sphere, our little soccer ball down here or up here. Okay, so question, very simple actually, can you compute those numbers? And it turns out that this is essentially impossible. Huh? Well, this is not quite clear. So if you do the first calculation like this one here, it looks like we can, but it's actually essentially impossible. So not much is known. I just pull up the table, how to read the table. So the pi's run in this direction and the spheres run in this direction. So S0 is a little bit boring. I will ignore S0 anyway. So S1 is the circle. S2 is the row I would like to uh, pull your attention to because it already gets pretty complicated. So here's the numbers are uh, two, two and 48, uh, what is it? 84, so two, two and 84, for example, for pi 14, of S2 and here uh, here we have Z for pi three of S2 and so on. And this whole line here uh, looks pretty complicated. So the when all the others like there's a Z mod 16, a Z mod 120. The only pattern that is kind of obvious is the diagonal here is always has always a copy of Z and everything below the diagonal is zero. So the theorem is we know infinitely many entries of that table even for the higher spheres. Um, but that's a bit of a bit of a lie because essentially only the only thing we know is the colored part, and the uh, the white part is unknown. So you could compute every entry, but um, there is no kind of type of formula or something. So it's it essentially not known. Um, the only row that are completely known are the boring ones. So S0 and S1, and already the S2 row, so we are talking about the soccer ball here, already the S2 row is not just not known, but it's essentially impossible to compute. And the only thing we know is, as I said, 
the slightly fattened diagonal here. So the diagonal is a black line. And we know a little bit more than the black line by some abstract nonsense. But everything else, the white part, is essentially completely open. In, in particular, I said again, the row for S2. So uh, the question of calculating those numbers is essentially hopeless. Already for space like the sphere, uh, which is usually considered to be very surprising. So not much, I probably shouldn't say that, but anyway, not much progress has been done on this question still since the 60s of the last century. And the notion of a pi n was introduced roughly in the 40s of the last century. So not much happened actually since then. I'm showing you how hard this problem is. I'm not saying nothing happened. Obviously, still people still work on this, but it's a really, really, really difficult problem. and. It's kind of very surprising that there is something we really don't know about uh, the sphere. But it's re I'm just talking, ignore the S case, the higher ones. I'm just talking about S2 here. There are a lot of facts that we don't know about S2. So here's the table again. And this entry is the first non-trivial one, as you can see, the first white one. So the first two ro rows are completely known. The first non-trivial white one is pi 3 of S2. And it's Z, and it's very hard actually to compute. So if you really want to do this computation, uh, you end up with a hop vibration, and it's really, really difficult. So uh, some people, in particular, more advanced topologists, would probably say that this pattern here is so that if we can't say anything about it, is not really surprising because there you go, you do the first non-trivial calculation, and it's just hard. Um, but of course, the surprising part here is that knowing nothing about the topic. There's some fact about the sphere, about the soccer ball that we don't understand. And not just that we don't understand it, but it's also essentially impossible to do. So um, I'm not saying it's, well, how do you get those entries? Well, there is actually an algorithm. So they are algorithmically computable. So all of these entries are co in principle computable by an, by an algorithm. But in the sense of complexity theory, it's just still ridiculously hard. So um, the numbers here are known by formulas, so everything colored, if you want, like formulas, whatever formula means. Uh, the other numbers are known by calculating the algorithm, essentially, uh, but the algorithm is also not very good. So no matter what you say about it, it's just really, really, really hard. I said again, if you are really interested in um, pi 512 of S2, the algorithm will compute it for you. So that's not the problem. Um, the problem is that kind of for, for in general, you just can't say anything about it. Okay, so this was actually a negative theorem, wasn't it? I essentially said there's no way to compute those numbers associated to spheres. So uh, we can give up. Um, no, not really. So people in topology, they just well study different invariants now, mostly associated to um, to topological spaces. So homology instead of those pies, for example, or stable hom uh, homotopy, uh, which is a version of the pies, which is kind of very much easier to compute. But just from the offset, the theorem is quite negative. There is something we don't know about the sphere. And this complexity theorem I showed you at the end very briefly because there was a a relatively complicated notion of complexity involved the W1. Um, but anyway, it's, it's essentially saying that we, we don't need to try. It's just literally very, very, very hard. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.